Hello and welcome to this video on convolutional neural networks. This is the first part of a three-part video series that captures both the theory and programming practice with CNNs in PyTorch. There are already many good resources on this topic available, but my goal here is to compress all the relevant things into these three videos. I would consider this video series as suitable for machine learning beginners or for more experienced people that want to refresh their knowledge. Let's quickly have a look at the agenda and the content I will capture here. I will start with explaining how CNNs work, including an explanation of the different layer types which are typically used. This will mostly happen in the first part of the series. I will use a specific example for predicting the seven wonders of the world on an image throughout all videos. Then we will build a simple CNN with PyTorch in the second part for exactly this prediction task. Additionally, I'll explain some concepts on working with image data. This also includes data augmentation and data pipelines. Then, in the last video, I'll explain the idea of transfer learning, which is commonly used when working with CNNs. In that section, I'll also quickly talk about different CNN architectures. And finally, I'll finish with some concepts from the area of explainable AI, which help you to better understand the CNN and what is going on inside your black box machine learning model. Enough talking, let's have a look at our use case. There's a selection of beautiful existing monuments in the world, which is called the New Seven Wonders of the World. In fact, there are eight wonders, as the pyramids in Egypt were added with an honorary status. Our goal for this video series is to predict which image contains which of the wonders using a convolutional neural network. This means we want to teach the computer to distinguish between different images. Given an input image, tell us which wonder of the world you see. This is a multi-classification problem as we want to classify each image according to one of the eight classes. A little side note, the image data we will use is royalty free and was downloaded from Pixabay as well as Pexels. So what we will build in the following is this neural network. It takes any of the images as input and predicts the label, so which wonder it is. Typically such a system can be split into two parts. The first part is the so-called feature extractor and the second part is the classifier or generally predictor. We can see the first part as the actual CNN that does the pre-processing of the image data and the second part is our classification model that uses the relevant information, also called features, for predictions. If you have trained a machine learning model in the past, you probably denoted the features with X and the targets with Y. Now here the CNN does nothing else but provide you with the X that can be used by your classifier. Let's have a look at the layers used in this network. If you're familiar with classical neural networks, you probably already know fully connected layers or dense layers. For these layers, each of the neurons is connected to all neurons of the next layer. The predictor part is typically built with these layers. For the actual CNN part, we have a couple of additional layer types now, which I will explain in the next minutes. The two most important ones are the convolutional layer, which filters out features from the image, and the pooling layer, which reduces the dimension of the extracted features. These layers can be combined and stacked in several ways, and we will learn more about this when we have a look at different CNN architectures. In this example, we have two convolutional layers and two pooling layers. To connect the feature extraction and the predictor, an additional operation such as flattening is typically applied. And finally, we have nonlinear activation functions both in the CNN and the fully connected neural network. Now we have a basic understanding of the structure of a CNN and we can have a look at the most interesting part, the feature extraction. CNNs are quite similar to ordinary neural networks, the main difference is that CNNs are made for images. More specifically, we talk about 2D CNNs here. In fact, there exist also 1D or 3D convolutions, but they will not be part of the series. For a computer, an image is nothing else but a grid of pixels with color values that usually lie between 0 and 255. Typically, if you have a colored image, it can be split into three channels, red, green and blue. This means you have three matrices of pixel values. Now this example is not perfectly accurate as the resolution of our image is actually much higher, but let's assume the pixels of our image look like this. Then this specific pixel has a red value of 156, a green value of 106 and a blue value of 17. Now you can also store the values for the image in a 3D matrix, which is typically referred to as a tensor or volume in deep learning. Here the width and height refer to the width and height of the image and the depth is equal to the number of color channels we have. This tensor allows deep learning frameworks like PyTorch to perform efficient tensor multiplications. These operations can be speeded up even further on a GPU or even TPU. 
Now, if we want to train a neural network with these images for a classification task, why don't we simply input the whole image into the input layer of a fully connected network? Or in other terms, why don't we use each color value of our three matrices as input feature? There are several reasons. First of all, this would lead to a lot of parameters. In our example, we have for the original image 600 by 300 pixel values and that for each of the three color channels. This means we have already more than half a million connections to only one neuron in our first dense layer. Having so many parameters makes the optimization of the network very difficult and would require a lot of data. Secondly, this would be even harder for the network as there are so many positions where things can change. For instance, this pyramid has a different size and shape than the ones on the other picture. In the literature, this is also called translational variance, which simply means the relevant features can appear at different positions. Now, instead of looking at atomic pixel values, it would make more sense to scan the image for specific patterns like the geometry or the top of a pyramid. We actually only need that information. CNNs include a mechanism to detect and filter out these visual features. Eventually, this will lead to an enormous reduction of parameters as we don't have to connect the neurons to each individual pixel, but instead only to these small areas. Before we can continue with CNNs, we have to get familiar with an important method in image processing, filters. A moment ago, we said we can use typical characteristics of a pyramid as features such as the top or the edges. But how do we actually get this information? In the area of computer vision, researchers have developed a variety of different algorithms that are capable of extracting certain patterns from images. In our case, for example, there exists a so-called edge detector that filters out all the edges in the image. A filter, or also called kernel, is a small matrix such as the one shown here. The values of this small matrix depend on what we want to filter out from the image. The shape of a filter is typically squared. Let's simplify our image for the following demonstration and assume we have only one color channel with these values. This filter is now applied to every equally sized area on the image. Or in other terms, the filter is slided over the image. This process is a so-called convolution between the filter and the image. Mathematically, this is nothing else but calculating the overlap of two functions. Let's have a look at an example. We can start at the first position of the image and multiply every element of this area with every element of the filter. And eventually we sum up all values to one number. This number will represent the existence of edges in this area and we store it in our feature map that can be seen as the filtered image. Now we move our filter to the next position and do the same procedure. We multiply this area with the filter, sum everything up and store the value in our feature map. We can see that we have a larger value now, as the first part of the pyramid edge is present in this local region. If we continue one more iteration, we can see that the value further increases, as we have more edges in this area and therefore a higher activation in our feature map. Another interesting part, what is the result when we do this? And since I promised a mix of theory and practice, we will now manually apply this filter with only a few lines of code, so let's switch to a Colab notebook to get the result. So this is the notebook we will use throughout the series and in this first section we will just quickly load the image from this path and we will use matplotlib for this. We will also decrease the dimension of the image which means we use one seventh of the image size to better suit our filter. If I print the first five pixel values we can see we have a red, green and blue value for each of them. We can now display the whole image using imshow from matplotlib. Now, when we want to apply the filter, what we do is we first define this filter matrix here. This is the X direction filter from the Sobel filter. So the Sobel filter consists of two filters and we will only use the one in the X direction. And to apply this filter, we simply iterate over the rows and columns. And then for each section of the image, we will multiply the section with the filter and sum it up using NumPy sum. And this gives us the activation of this filter in the corresponding area. And we store this in our placeholder, which stands for the filtered image. So if we display the filtered image now, we can see we've filtered out the edges of the pyramids and also a little bit of noise, which are smaller edges on the pyramids. But generally we have got the contour or the shape of the pyramid simply by applying this filter. The way how these filters work is that they lead to high activation values whenever the specific pattern that the filter is looking for is present in the local region. 
Have a look at this example. You can see a clear edge between these two colors. Converted to color values, the computer would see a grid such as this one. If we manually apply this filter now, we get high activation values on the output for the areas where the edge was located. The edge detector basically checks where our input suddenly changes. And that's exactly what happened in the code we just used. So now we have seen an example of how we can use filters in image processing. But what do we need CNNs for now? A filter is designed to detect one specific property. For instance, the edge detector we just implemented just looks for edges. But as we encounter increasingly complex images and also a wide variety of images, we need many other things to look for. As a solution, we could just apply a lot of custom, also called handcrafted filters, that scan the image for specific patterns. It turned out that this process can be very tedious. Instead, why don't we just let a neural network find the optimal filters for our data? And that's exactly what CNNs do. They learn several filters and therefore they can learn to extract features automatically. This means by looking at the training data we feed in, CNNs figure out by themselves what information to extract from the image. Now we are ready to talk about the convolutional layer used in CNNs. The convolutional layer is the core building block of a CNN. This layer simply applies the filter on the image and outputs the feature map, which is just another image. This is also called discrete convolution. The feature map shows the activation, which means it tells us where the visual pattern of the filter is present in our image. The new part here is now that the filter is a learnable matrix. That means the values are determined by the CNN in the learning process. They are initialized randomly, for example using a Gaussian distribution and adjusted through backpropagation. For instance, you start with this randomly initialized filter that filters out no useful information. Then the filter is successively adjusted to extract patterns that are useful for the correct classification, such as the edges of the pyramid. Furthermore, there are a few options we can configure for this layer. First of all, how do we perform the sliding? A stride of 1 means we shift the filter by 1 pixel in both dimensions when we calculate the convolution. A stride of 2 is performed by shifting the filter by 2 pixels. This can also be interpreted as the step size of our convolution. You might have already realized that the size of our feature map after applying the filter decreased. More precisely, we've lost the border of our image. The reason for this is that the center of our first filter is not actually the pixel on the top left, but instead the second pixel in the second row. When we compute the convolution and store the result in our activation map, the dimension will be smaller. To account for this, a typical approach is to add padding around the input image to preserve the shape. There exist different strategies such as zero padding, which is used here, or average padding. As you can see, through adding this artificial border, the output will generate the same shape as the input. Now let's talk a bit about the dimensions and shapes of these operations. Our input is a two-dimensional image with three color values. We've seen before that we can also represent this as a three-dimensional tensor with a depth of three. Now when we want to apply filters on this tensor, these filters also need to be three-dimensional as they are applied on each color channel. This means our filters are also tensors, for instance, with a width and height of 5 and a depth of 3. Each of these filters generates an activation map, which is one-dimensional. So in this case, we get four filtered images. Again, we can stack them to a tensor of depth 4 and apply the next set of filters, for instance, eight different filters, which now need to have a depth of 4 as well. I personally found it a bit difficult to move from classical fully connected neural networks to CNNs as I was always searching for weights and neurons. There are no real neurons in CNNs but I found this visual analogy quite useful. If you want to convert the convolution back to a fully connected neural network, you could see the image region as the input neurons and the values on the activation map as neuron of the next layer. The weights between these neurons would be the values of the filter. Such as these connections show the first element in the image region has the first filter value as weight, the second element has the second filter value as weight and so on. All of them are connected to only one neuron on the feature map. And this brings us to another important concept regarding CNNs, which is weight sharing. Imagine we would connect all the pixels, so not just this small region, to the neuron on the right. 
This would be equivalent to a fully connected network. Weight sharing is used in CNNs and simply means we have the same weights, so the same small filter for the whole image. This way we for instance only need to learn these nine parameters, which saves us from a lot of complexity. Some additional remarks on this, you can also calculate the height and width of the filtered image after applying convolution using these formulas from PyTorch. As you can see, we find all the things we previously discussed here, the padding, the kernel size, the stride, and finally dilation, which is just another option to configure the filtering operation. If the height and width of the image are equal, this formula is the same for both dimensions. Now, there's one piece missing in our puzzle. How do we get from simple low-level features like edges to more concrete filters that can for instance detect objects? The trick here is to stack multiple filters and that's exactly what is done when we stack layers in the CNN. This way we will feature hierarchies, which means Different filters are applied successively on filtered images. The machine learning area around this is also called deep learning because of this layer stacking that leads to high level representations. The region that is captured by the stacked filters increases, which allows the CNN to capture complex features on any area of the image. Let's have a look at this example. In order to preserve the size of the filtered image, we will use a border padding here. So if we convolute this input with a filter, we could for instance get the edges of the image. The regions of our input are mapped to single values on the filtered image. Now what happens if we convolute again on this filtered image? Let's first add padding again and now we can apply another filter. For instance, this filter searches for the top of the pyramid. In our outputs, we now have a high activation for this area. If we look back to the original input, we can see that a larger area is now captured by this blue filter. This is because the information in the image was already summarized by the previous purple filter. If we apply another filter, like this orange one, we now capture the features in almost the whole image. We can see that our receptive field grows when we stack filtering operations. This means we find very low level features like edges in the first layers of the network and very high level features such as objects in the final layers. Any object on an image can generally always be decomposed in smaller features such as edges or circles. Our brain does nothing else than using such a feature hierarchy to process our visual input. You apply several filters which produce several filtered images and by stacking and combining these you can compose more complex features in the higher layers of the network. For instance, a face consists of eyes, a nose, a mouth. Each of these parts can be constructed in a hierarchy of features. For a trained CNN, it is also possible to visualize how the filtering operations in different layers look like. Here are some examples for different types of objects. The low levels of the network filter, for instance, edges, the middle layers, parts of objects, and the higher layers, the complete objects like cars or faces. When we build our CNN for the new seven wonders of the world later, we will also create such visualizations. We haven't talked about the pooling layer yet. Its main functionality is to summarize and reduce the dimension of a feature map. This is done for two reasons. First of all, to reduce the number of parameters and generally the size of the tensors. And secondly, to increase the robustness against variance in the data. There are different possibilities to perform pooling. Two common ones are max pooling and mean pooling. We also have a kernel size here that is slided over the image but instead we just take the max or the mean of this area. In this example, we have the activation grid with differently colored areas, which is reduced to the outputs on the right. Note that pooling layers have no trainable weights, as they just take, for example, the max or mean. Here we can see that the shape of our tensor was reduced to one fourth, but the activations in each area of our feature map are maintained. We basically summarize the feature map into smaller representations. We are now at the end of the section and I just quickly want to summarize the most important points. We input our colored image with three channels to a convolutional layer, which will learn to extract the most valuable information on the image. We apply end filters here that produce end feature maps for which we reduce the dimension using a pooling layer. We stack this module several times until we input the results into a fully connected network that outputs our prediction. We've also seen that CNNs have fewer parameters that need to be optimized compared to classical fully connected networks. Another big advantage is that CNNs learn to extract important features by themselves instead of manually crafting features as it was done in the past. Finally, CNNs are invariant to translations, 
which means it doesn't matter where a specific object is located on an image. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next two videos where we will finally build a CNN for our Wonder of the World classification and also get familiar with how we can improve and better understand our model using explainable AI.